Okay, thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Bruce Balcom. Um, he is a tier one Canada chair at the University of New Brunswick. Um, he has uh, worked on a variety of imaging techniques, uh, ranging from fluorescence to magnetic uh, resonance imaging. Currently, he is the director of the UNB uh, MRI Research Center. Uh, which is known as the leading uh, center for MRI materials laboratories worldwide. Um, his work has also resulted in a spin-off of a company for green imaging technologies. So without further ado, Professor Bruce Balcom. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. Um, I'd like to thank the conference uh, for inviting me, but also for you attending, filling this uh, very large, or partially filling this very large and beautiful auditorium. I I'm going to talk about magnetic resonance today. I'm experimentally oriented, so as I tell the story, I'm going to tell it by way of magnetic resonance and magnetic resonance experiments, building to what I think the important message is going to be. I'll tell you about shale, and in particular, I'm going to emphasize the importance of magnetic resonance lifetimes, a magnetic resonance correlation experiment that's already used in shales, and then our new T1, T2 star magnetic resonance measurement, which will show us how to do MRI of shales and, and processes in shales. So over the last two days, we've heard a lot about the, the energy transition. So I believe in the energy transition, there will be one. I feel a little awkward talking about shales. Uh, but let me tell you, the method that I'm gonna develop for you uh, was intended for mixture measurements, solids and liquids, solids and liquids in porous media. We've most developed these ideas in shales, but I can tell you right now, they would be dynamite for CO2 and hydrogen storage in porous and microporous materials. And although there is going to be an energy transition right now, our world does depend on hydrocarbons. I'm not from the United States, I'm from Canada, but development of shale resources transformed petroleum production in the United States, as you can see around the early 2000s. Exploitation of resources from shale led the United States to become a net petroleum exporting country. So people do care a lot about shales, and if you're not familiar with the shale, it's really the source rock for conventional petroleum resources. Uh, we will often have a layer of uh, organic material, which given time, pressure and temperature will transform into the more conventional uh, petroleum products. And if the geology is right underground, we'll have a migration of these species into trapped layers where they could be extracted in a more conventional way. But of course, in the shale layer, there will be a lot of oil and gas, and, and it is figuring how to do a direct extraction of these hydrocarbons from the shale, which transformed things in the petroleum industry. Now, the shale layer, layer is usually a very poor reservoir, low, low porosity, low permeability. Uh, the shale has pores which are full of organic matter. The pores are very small. This gives us low porosity and low permeability, which makes it very challenging to try and analyze in a laboratory sense for fluids in the shale. The conventional methods that you would read about in petroleum um, um, engineering textbooks really don't work very well. And this is why magnetic resonance has become very prominent uh, for analysis of shales. Um, it's non-invasive, so we don't have to extract the fluids in order to analyze for them. Because it's non-invasive, we can do measurements on an intact core plugs, of course, with the native fluid presence, and therefore there's minimal sample preparation involved. Now, let me tell you some simple magnetic resonance. We're gonna be interested in water and oil, or water and hydrocarbons. Each has hydrogen. Hydrogen is a spin one half nuclei, and if we were to place those nuclei in a static magnetic field, a B0 field, uh, quantum mechanically, we would have a restriction of orientation of those nuclei. Their magnetic moments would be aligned either partially parallel or partially anti-parallel with the, the applied field. If we add up all these individual magnetic moments vectorially, the resultant is M0. This is our sample magnetization. 
Sample magnetization is what we will manipulate and attempt to measure. The equation on the top right gives you an analytical expression for M0. You'll notice it's directly proportional to the number of nuclei. It's directly proportional to the applied field B0. It's inversely proportional to the temperature. And there's a collection of quantum mechanical and other constants in the rest of the equation. This doesn't permit us to distinguish the water and the oil. They will both contribute to N and they will both contribute to M0. So we're not gonna do spectroscopy. The way we're gonna distinguish between water and oil is going to be through the lifetime of the signal that is generated. So are, there are many properties of interest and importance that one can use magnetic resonance for in order to characterize shale. But we're just gonna focus on trying to determine how much water and how much oil is present. And again, this is gonna be based on signal lifetimes. In magnetic resonance, the signal lifetimes and two representative lifetimes are T1 and T2 depends very much on the mobility of the nuclei, which is to say the mobility of the molecules. Relaxation is driven by fluctuations in the magnetic field uh, of the nuclei of interest. And if those fluctuations are at the right frequency, then we will have relaxation either efficiently or inefficiently. Uh, truly, the basic ideas behind this were established by Blomberg and Pound and Purcell, Purcell in 1948, uh, the famous BPP theory. And, and what it shows is for a model isotropic liquid, the dependence of lifetimes T1 and T2 on the correlation time. That's really just a statement of how rapidly the molecule is, uh, is rotating in space. And you can see we have lifetimes which span six orders of magnitude, as long as 10 seconds or, or, or somewhat longer to as short as 10 microseconds. And there's a big split in the behavior that we see here between T1 and T2 that as we move towards solid species, T2 gets very short, but T1 can become very long. There's lots, this is a model system, there's lots of dependencies on motion in these magnetic resonance lifetimes. Now we're not gonna be thinking about measuring an isolated pure system. We're gonna be measuring fluids in a pore space. And, and, and one of the reasons that magnetic resonance is so useful in the petroleum sector is that the observed lifetimes are very dependent on the pore size. We often assume that molecules in the pore transit the pore very rapidly. And when they collide with the pore surface, we can also have relaxation. Different mechanism, very important mechanism. Uh, and it affects both T1 and T2. So you see the equation at the bottom, it says that the inverse of the lifetime of interest depends on the pore size. We're gonna use surface over volume of the pore as a proxy for size. And we have in front of that a surface relaxivity, which can be different for T1 and T2. So these two slides have shown us that the lifetimes are sensitive both to mobility and environment. And all of these things are going to be happening in the pore space of the shale. Now, let me show you a bit about how we would measure T2. We have our sample placed in the magnet. We have an M0. To that M0, we'll apply a series of radio, X, radio frequency excitation pulses. That's the top line in the figure at left. I'm not gonna say a whole lot about that, but this combination of excitation gives us what's called an echo train. You see the observable signal, we have a rise and then a fall, and then a rise and a fall and a rise and a fall. These are the echoes. And if we were to look at the decay of the peak of the individual spin echoes, we can describe that by the equation that's written immediately below uh, the figure. Now we have a problem here. We have a limitation on observation. We don't get our first data point until the first echo time. And then our next data point is the second echo time, the third data point is the third echo time and so on. And the echo time is usually hundreds of microseconds and in some cases can be longer. With T1 measurement, we can either invert our sample magnetization or zero it as shown here. And then we wait in time, we wait time tau, that's a chosen time. And then we apply an excitation pulse to measure how much it has recovered. And uh, this 
measurement will tell us what the T1 lifetime is. The, the governing equation is again immediately below the figure, but we shouldn't have time T there, it should be time tau. We do this measurement as a function of tau. The example I've got in the bottom right, this is cod liver oil. It has a T1 lifetime of about 100 milliseconds because it's a viscous liquid. Bulk water would be a couple seconds. So we're now seeing the importance of mobility in determining these lifetimes. Now, about 20 years ago, some very clever colleagues at Schlumberger thought about trying to combine these two measurements into one. Uh, it was based on work in universities, but they really conceptualized it and made it work and then popularized. And this is a, called a relaxation correlation measurement. It's a combination of a T1 and T2 measurement. Let's look first at the right-hand side of the figure. Uh, this is giving us a spin echo train. So we're gonna have a whole series of T2 weighted data points there, but we're gonna execute the measurement uh, while waiting different intervals of time tau for T1 recovery. So we do a whole series of these measurements and we'll get a data set that's a two-dimensional time domain data set. We see the equation in the center bottom, it has our T1 dependence, our T2 dependence, and F of T1, T2, that's the quantity that we're trying to determine experimentally. How much material are we gonna have that has different T1 and T2 coordinates? The inverse Laplace transform process, uh, there are three or four packages that exist to do this around the world. Uh, we use the Schlumberger package, it works and we don't attempt to delve into it. Uh, more seriously uh, mathematically. Let me show you a real simple example of this. Uh, it's a ripening avocado. You think of an avocado, you know it has water and oil. There's different mobility of the water and oil depending on the different molecular environments within the avocado. The oil species are labeled O, the water species are labeled W, and you can see immediately we have speciation. We have different water and oil environments. This is also a quantitative measurement because if we integrate under these peaks, we get a measurement of quantity. So this is obviously an attractive thing to try and do with shales because the shale has water and oil. Magnetic resonance T1s and T2s are good at measuring water and oil in different environments. So it was quite natural that people attempted to do this. And this is done seriously by many people, many companies around the world, because it's the best way to analyze water and oil and shale. But the experimental result, which is typical in the center bottom, is pretty poor, pretty poor. We see broad peaks, not a lot of definition, but we know there are a whole lot of different environments of the water and oil in the shale. So this is what people live with, but it really isn't very satisfactory. Um, Schlumberger colleagues have generated the figure uh, center top where they attempt to describe all the different environments that would be present and what you can assign them to. And if you're attempting to do this with an experimental result such as we see at the bottom, it's, it's really fantasy land. If we have belief, we can try and analyze this for water and oil. Now, the, the essential problem is we do have a lot of components and the T2 lifetimes are very short. So the, the horizontal scale is a log scale. You, so you can see we have very short lived lifetimes and we're trying to measure the transverse decay with echo times, which are similar to the lifetime. We just don't have very many data points in order to try and characterize the decay. Okay. So let me repeat that. The T2 lifetimes observed are on the order of the echo time. So we just don't have very many data points in these systems. So in the early stages of COVID, when we were thinking about what were good things to do to keep people occupied, our new measurement T1, T2 star was uh, in progress. And I had a student who really wanted to analyze shales. So I said, why don't you try this new method with shales? And the idea is that we don't use a T2 lifetime for this analysis. We use T2 star, another lifetime as a proxy. T2 star is the simplest possible magnetic resonance lifetime measurement because the decay after a single excitation pulse called a free induction decay, decays with a T2 star lifetime. Now the name T2 star suggests that it's connected to T2 and that's true as shown in the equation uh, bottom left. The inverse of T2 star is equal to the inverse of T2 plus 
a magnetic field and homogeneity term. Now we're gonna have a lot of magnetic field and homogeneity in the pore space of a shale, but if T2 is very short lived, it will be the thing that determines T2 star. So you could say we can use T2 star as a proxy for T2. And the advantage of this approach is that the first data point that we would attempt to acquire is not limited by the uh, echo time, it's limited by the dead time of the radio frequency probe, which is probably gonna be a few tens of microseconds. Now, subsequent data points that we would acquire would be have an interval, which is the sampling interval in, in magnetic resonance called the dwell time. And this is gonna be microseconds and can easily be less than that. So we're automatically going to have much more data defining the T2 dimension or, or now the T2 star dimension. So we can acquire hundreds or even thousands of these FID data points instead of two or three echoes. This is incredibly simple, uh, but simplicity is good, simplicity works, and it's the key to the why this technique works so well. Instead of trying to work with a little bit of data, we suddenly have a lot of data to characterize the transverse decay. Now, let me put the new measurement in the context of the old measurement. So the old measurement T1, T2 is top right. We saturate uh, the sample magnetization, we let it recover during time tau, and then we acquire an echo train and we repeat it with a different time tau. Now, instead of doing that, we'll saturate weight time tau as we would have done anyway before applying a single excitation pulse and recording a free induction decay. From the data handling point of view, there's actually no difference between these. From a data processing point of view, they're in fact exactly the same. Very little needs to be done to change um, into doing this measurement. Now, let me show you how well it works. So on the, the figure on the left is the experimental example I showed you before. The figure on the right, same sample, is the T1, T2 star analysis. And all of a sudden now you see we have really good definition of peaks and we're able to segregate the very large signal from the kerogen, the immature hydrocarbon from the water and the oil. And the oil peaks are colored red, the water peaks are colored blue. You might say, how do I know? I'll come back and tell you uh, the, the reasons for these assignments. This measurement's done on a core plug. Diameter would have been about one inch, length probably an inch and a half. It was done in a 2.4 Tesla horizontal bore uh, magnet. And we acquire a very good signal to noise in order to do these inversions. And the signal to noise in the, in the 2D time domain uh, data set would have been 300 to 1,000. Notice there's also a green peak in the display. We have such good resolution, we're actually able to add an external marker. So we add a reference sample, which is just water doped to control the relaxation times. And we know exactly how much water is there. So we know exactly how much hydrogen uh, that lets us scale the hydrogen content of all the other peaks here. If we know the molecular formula, I guess as we would in water, we could approximate it for the oil. We can turn that into absolute content of water or oil. Kerogen is a little bit more amorphous. So oftentimes we would just leave it as hydrogen content for the different peaks. Now, let me prove to you the assignments. Um, we had very good advice uh, from a colleague and the advice in the end was simple as we were trying to figure out what are these different peaks. And he said, well, if you uh, change the relative humidity, either increasing to increase the water content or decreasing to decrease the water content, you should be able to identify what the water peaks are. So we crushed the sample, did this, and that lets us identify the water peak. If we were then to mildly warm the sample and do an evaporation, uh, we will lose both water and oil signal and that lets us assign the water and oil peaks in the T1, T2 star uh, spectrum. Now, uh, I'll prove to you the measurement is quantitative for uh, water and oil content because as we do this manipulation of fluids, we can plot the integrated signal 
as we make the change versus the mass change of the sample. And you see, we get a straight line, both for water and oil. So our assignments are correct, at least for this sample. And we have a quantitative measurement. Now, we can begin to think about making it a little bit more interesting. Um, we could manipulate the water content in a different way, a way that would be representative of a process. And that would be imbibition of water or rather brine. So over a number of months, we would just dip these samples into a, a little uh, reservoir of brine, let the imbibition take place, and then periodically measure the T1, T2 star uh, spectrum. And you can see there's a differentiation in behavior of the W1 and W2 peaks. From the, the difference in the lifetimes, we could imagine that W2 with the longer lifetimes is due to microfractures in the shale. And, and you can see in the results here that it is the peak W2 that takes up water preferentially to W1. They both increase, but W2 increases faster and it increases first. Uh, the other peaks, the kerogen and the oil, don't increase very much, certainly early on. Later on, they do increase, but maybe we're changing the mobility uh, through the water uptake. Now, a very interesting feature of this is the T1, T2 star is telling us the relaxation behavior of the different fluid species present. So we could think about trying to use this information in order to do imaging. So these lifetimes are completely amenable to doing imaging. We can do core plug uh, scale imaging with millimeter spatial resolution. It's hard to do better, but the lifetimes are telling us pore scale information. We're not resolving the pores, but we have information on the pore scale behavior. Let me go back. You'll notice if we concentrate on the water and oil, there's not a big difference in the T2 star dimension the systematic differences in T1. So the measurement that we would invoke in order to analyze for water and oil is a measurement developed in my lab about 20 years ago called uh, centric scan sprite. We can tune the parameters of the imaging so that we will not record any signal from the carriage and we will only get water and oil. But there's no contrast between water and oil in T2 stars, so we add in a preparation so-called, which is a T1 encoding. And we do this multiple times, different T1 weightings added to the imaging in order to differentiate the water and oil spatially. So here's a 1D result, four different samples, similar behavior, but the most interesting behavior is the top two. The vertical axis in each case is position, it's 1D space. The horizontal axis is a T1 axis. And what you see, particularly easy to see in EG11, is that the oil content is higher in some spatial positions and, it, and the displacement is regular. And in the intermediate positions, the uh, water content is higher. So what we think we're seeing is the effect of bedding planes where some planes are enriched in water, some are enriched in oil. Not, a, not all samples show this, but many in fact do. Now, if we can image in one dimension, we should be able to image in three dimensions, and yes, we can. And we can invoke this contrast of T1 to figure out where's the water and where's the oil. And in the 3D image that I'm showing you here, uh, water-rich layers are labeled with the blue and the oil-rich layers are in red. Now, imaging in 3D is sort of interesting, but the real advantage of magnetic resonance for being non-invasive is that we can think about imaging a process, so a time-dependent change. And of course, the time-dependent change is going to be imbibition of the brine. So over a number of months, we did 3D images. I'm only gonna show you 2D slices from four. Uh, the brine is imbibing from below. And what you see is that there is a layer where the brine rushes in uh, quite promptly, but then hits a micro crack that we didn't otherwise see, which is the diagonal at uh, giving us high signal intensity and it's filling with water. 
Um, and then there is more general uh, water invasion. Now, uh, this was an unconfined sample. So that if this had been in a core holder under pressure, this would have been a much uh, slower process, but we thought several months was long enough. Uh, the last thing I'm going to say is we're now confident we can analyze for oil and water, um, and we're differentiating the kerogen signal. So this is probably going to lead us to an ability to characterize the shale, characterize the kerogen in order to think about quality of the shale rock in terms of a reservoir. So I hope I've convinced you that the T1, T2 star measurement gives us a high quality way to analyze for fluids and shales. It leads us to imaging um, and it is probably, well, and it is a very general method that's applicable to many other uh, porous systems. In terms of an outlook, we know that these methods are going to aid shell, shell characterization and be used in the industry. From first publication to an awarded patent to licensing, um, and very shortly commercialization is under two years. That's the fastest for my lab ever. Um, the quality of the result means that we can have much more sophisticated analyses. For example, kerogen assessment. I wanna emphasize again, this is quite general. There are variations on this method that I haven't shown that speed it up by about an order of magnitude. The results that I showed you take 30 to 60 minutes with the instrumentation I described. Uh, the faster methods lets us, let us do this in two or three minutes. Uh, finally, for anybody who's interested in doing this, this is the ideal instrument. It's simple, it's a desktop permanent magnet, magnetic resonance instrument. It doesn't do imaging, uh, but it has the dead time and the dwell time characteristics that will let us uh, do these analyses very well. And it permits uh, variable sample temperature so we can manipulate uh, mobility. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, funders for this work, uh, Green Imaging Technologies, who's the company that's associated with my lab, and various other industry sponsors uh, who I have not asked for permission uh, to show their names, so I won't. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Are there any questions? Could you come to a microphone? Hi. Uh, did you ever try with uh, using low field? I, yes. I don't think it's enough because it's, it's too low porosity for the signal, right? Uh, so what would you call low field? What? What would you call low field? Maybe two megahertz. Yeah, I wouldn't bother two megahertz instrument. Oh, yeah. oh. Uh, one of the big, pro the bigger problem is actually the dead time is going to be quite long. Uh, yes, you won't get as much signal because the field is lower. Uh, the ideal instrument is probably 23 megahertz. Um, we've done this quite a bit at eight megahertz. Uh, there's just less signal than there is at, at higher frequency and higher field. Yeah, that's not perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? I have a question. Please. So the, the spatial resolution that you described was, was fairly coarse. Yes. Is it enough to be able to tell where the films of either oil or water are, or is this- No, and, and so this is, uh, this magnetic resonance is inherently a low resolution technique. We can try for higher resolution. We will achieve higher resolution. In specialty applications, we can get much higher resolution, but routinely it is probably better to change. It's probably better to, to, to exchange measurement time for resolution. A millimeter is a reasonable resolution. So what that'll do is in a macroscopic sample, say a core plug, you'll be able to tell the difference between the ends and the middle and the sides. You cannot, get poor level resolution. And my assertion would be it's a waste of time to try because the magnetic resolution, magnetic resonance relaxation times are actually reporting on the pore level. So in general, we would know what the wetting fluid is in a region of the sample through the lifetimes that are measured. We don't try and image it. Thank you. 
Any other questions? Yes, one quick follow up. What is the, the typical duration for, for imaging in, in these MRIs? Uh, for the imaging measurements that I showed, uh, there would have been multiple images taken with different T1 weightings. The entire series would have been a few hours. Okay. Now that's not short, but it, it's not short in absolute time, but it's actually short compared to the time scale of the changes that are happening here, which were over months. Okay, okay I guess if there's no further questions, um, I want to thank Mr. Zulkin for his excellent talk.